Bakulin, uh, who is from Imperial College London, and it's an experimental talk. And the topic of the talk is um, a study of exit on localization in F8. Uh, thank you, Oleg. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay. And um, I can see your slides. Uh -huh. Okay, I will start presentation in a second. Does it look decent? Uh, it's still not in presentation mode, but it looks okay. Uh, does uh, it now look... it's presentation mode. Huh? Yeah, good. You can see it. Perfect. Maybe you want to use a pointer if you like. Okay, okay. Uh, one second. It's up to you, yeah. Better? Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Oleg, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Johan, to, uh, for bringing this workshop in this difficult time together is a lot of a lot of theory for me, but I kind of enjoy it. So there will be a big switch of the gears here going to uh, spectroscopy, ultrafast spectroscopy, and this will be more focused talk. It will it will be a rare case of uh, kind of intra institutional pro uh, project. All work is done in uh, Imperial College, and uh, spectroscopy was done in my group and group of James Durant. And there was some technical development done in physics department in the group of John Tisch. And we are now getting some input from modeling from group of Jenny Nelson. So I, I will not actually give any reasonable introduction. I would rather say what has triggered uh, my interest. Uh, um, uh, where, where did work come from? It came from two projects we had uh, last year with a group of uh, Kuhn van de Waal. And you probably know Kuhn van de Waal. Uh, works a lot on organic photovoltaics, and he also works a lot with uh, small molecule cells. So the first system we looked at was uh, a, very, a classical system, alpha-6T, uh, so the al oligothiophene. Uh, uh, this, this is a small molecule which you can evaporate uh, on a substrate. And what was surprising, if you just uh, make a solar cell based on oligothiophene, so just one material, no donor except a mixture, uh, no nothing, you will still get external quantum efficiency of this device around almost 50% and quite decent uh, photovoltaic performance uh, of the cell. Um, some people would say maybe there are some interfaces with electrodes, but if you play with interfaces with electrodes, uh, uh, most, of el el most of interfaces will work and there is no evidence uh, interfaces will drive charge separation. So we tried to look at this with spectroscopy point of view. Uh, we did some st uh, standard transient absorption measurements, and we realized that in pure film of alpha-60, uh, no interface, no doping, no nothing, we still see conversion of exciton to charge. So this is raw graph, this is kinetics we extracted. A lot of charge is generated very early, and then there is even more charge generated in 100 picoseconds. Uh, this is surprising, as there should be no driving force to uh, split exciton into separate electron and hole. When we looked uh, in more detail into this, and there were a lot of groups involved doing morphological studies and modeling, uh, we came up to this uh, picture where depending on the deposition of alpha-6 T, we can have uh, local domains of alpha-6 T uh, packed in slightly different uh, ways and different packing, standing in line, how we call it, uh, give little bit different energetics, which can be seen by photo emission. And this uh, steps in energetics in pure alpha-6 T, uh, alpha T film uh, can lead to, can provide enough uh, gradient to split ex uh, excitons into free carriers. So this is uh, one, one of examples where system where there shouldn't be any driving force uh, actually works well. Another case is maybe even more mysterious. Here we looked on this sub and C molecule, this molecule, and sorry, this molecule and its derivatives are quite popular for photovoltaics as well. If you make a device of this material, you can also get uh, external quantum efficiencies up to 40%. And in this case, 
what we saw in, in alpha 60 that there are domains with different energetics this argument can't work because the material uh, the fields of this material are amorphous films so there are no domains and there are no domain boundaries we were trying to look how this small molecule by itself can lead to charge generation uh, again use transient absorption spectroscopy and when we looked at a pure film of sub and c uh, we uh, we realize that we see signals but those signals are not ex actually charges the signals we see at long times are artifacts of heating up the sample so actually if you just take some pure sub and c film you will create excitons this exciton will eventually uh, relax but no charges will be generated however if you make a device uh, in the device you will get current and if you uh, it's a little bit more tricky measurement if you do measurement on sub and c device uh, then you will see that uh, spectra are changing with time and you can analyze it and you can find out that actually excitons become, become charge carriers again there is always a question of interface maybe if, if in device you have electrodes there is some driving force uh, uh, between uh, hole extraction and electron extraction material and active layer we try to uh, check it we put uh, sub and c uh, in interface with very different materials. We, we basically made only half cell from this side, half cell from this side. But whenever we made a half cell or not complete cell, we never saw charge generation. And only when we made a complete cell, complete working device, we saw that charge generation is active. And, uh, the only explanation we could come up with uh, was that there is some field inside the device we have two electrodes so there are some space charge there is some space charge or external bias and this uh, uh this electrodes field which electrodes create uh help exciton uh, to split into carriers i'm not fully happy with this explanation but this is uh, the, the only one we could come up with and this tells that apparently maybe we don't know everything about excitons maybe there is some complexities in exciton dynamics and we can engineer excitons which are inorganics which are very easy to split so these two works uh, triggered some interest uh, in my group uh, um, towards looking on uh, dynamics of of, of, uh, of pure excitons in, in just single component material and homojunctions so how we can control exciton dissociation for example for photovoltaic uh, for photovoltaic application what controls exciton dissociation um, in very oversimplified uh, way uh, existing paradigm of exciton formation can be uh, shown here in two steps we excite electron from ground state somewhere uh, to one of electronic states it can be a uh, low uh, lowest electronic state can be some vibronic state high line electronic state i will just generally call them hot exciton and then after we created this hot exciton things happen and uh, during this workshop we, we we saw different processes which can happen there can be uh, localization then um, molecular structure can re react can be reorganization um, energy can flow to phonons and phonons can affect back on electronic system or there may be there are a lot of molecules and they are all in different environments so maybe electronic state will sample uh, the local uh, energetic uh, landscape but eventually when all this is done uh, our exciton will become what you can call cold exciton or bound electron hole pair uh, more or less localized uh, uh, in certain in certain point in space uh, so we know where we start and we know where we end and there are different ideas what's what is happening but actually it's surprisingly there are surprisingly little uh, known from experimental point of view what is actually going on uh, we start with hot exciton we come to cold exciton but here we can only speculate uh, uh, what process has a dominant uh, dominant effect and i think we should be indeed we should be more explicit in the step two what is going on over here we look through the literature what people do to see how hot exciton evolves to some more localized and bound state uh, there are many ways uh, uh, 
this is one of the probably first and uh, one of the one of the paper setting the stage, which uh, by Anna Köhler in '98 showing that if you go to very high electronic state, it's more delocalized and there is more chance to to dissociate into the carriers. Then people try to look on the dynamics, look on, for example, anisotropy. So if dipole moment is changing when you uh, go from one electronic state to another, you can catch it in the anisotropy of the response. You can try to uh, look on the conductive properties. If exciton becomes a CT exciton or dissociates into free carriers, you should be able to see it with terahertz. People try it. Uh, very popular is dynamic stock shift. Uh, Natalie Banerjee did a lot on this uh, about a decade ago. Transient absorption, many, many, many people do. And uh, probably one of the most promising uh, methods is uh, two photon photo emission because it allows you to see actual energy of individual states. There are, there are I can't list all work, but there are huge, there is a huge number of uh, methods to look on the uh, exit on early dynamics. And they, I mean, good news, they converge to some. Uh, to some conclusions. Uh, for example, most of the methods say that there is about 100 femtosecond time scale of energy loss of hot exciton. And depending, uh, usually it depends on the time resolution of the method. People, people uh, and depending on the system, people claim something between 50 and 300 femtosecond, uh, how, how, how fast hot state becomes cold state. Again, most of the methods agree that there is a localized state formed when the energy is lost. And uh, many methods also agree that spontaneous exciton dissociation, if exciton dissociate into carriers, this usually happens very early. It happens before exciton loses uh, its excess energy. However, um, most of these methods uh, are blind to, 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 very, to very important uh, properties of exciton dynamics. First of all, most of these methods uh, have about 100 to 300 femtosecond uh, time resolution. Uh, there are new techniques like uh, 2D, which, uh, which was discussed earlier, but most of the reports uh, are time resolution limited. Uh, then it's very hard to say what is exactly the energy of the state. Is it a bound state or is it the localized state? Is it independent electron and hole? There are some effects of exciton exciton annihilation, which can mask the effects we want to know. And again, there is the question what happens in actual optoelectronic device? Because most of the methods I listed above were done on the model systems, on the films, or even solutions. So we decided to. Um, contribute to this, to this broad field. And our approach was to choose a, our favorite technique and do measurements as fast as possible. Uh, our, well, maybe not our favorite, but at least the kind of unique technique we have in our group is device-based technique, which we call pump push photocurrent. In an application to excitons, it would look in the following way. We will have a working device where we'll have a Homo junction, basically just organic material between two electrodes, and we will measure current uh, uh, from the device. We will first shine visible light, which will excite uh, our organic, it will create excitons in our organic molecule. This exciton will be initially hot, maybe then it will cool down, will become a bound electron hole pair. And then we can come with another pulse, it's infrared pulse, which will normally not be absorbed by the material in the in the device, but uh, we can choose valence such that it will be absorbed uh, by uh, by excitonic state. It will basically lead from excited state to high excited state. And when this infrared photon gives extra energy to bound exciton state, this bound exciton state might have a chance to split into electron and hole, and then we can detect uh, current uh, from this splitting. So in this technique, we will only see signal if we have a bound state, if electron and hole are linked together, if we need infrared light to break them apart. If our state is such that eventually it will dissociate by itself, then infrared light will not, uh, will not increase the current coming from the device. We will get current anyway, the exciton will dissociate. So we will, this technique selectively observes 
only bound exciton, only in the moments of time when exciton is already bound. And another technique is a standard technique which uh, most of spectroscopists are using. It's a pump probe technique where with one pulse we create exciton and with another pulse we just monitor absorption of the exciton so we can see the population of excitons as a function of time. Again, most of the measurements which are done with standard absorption have about 100 fem uh, femtosecond time resolution. We wanted to go faster, we wanted to resolve things. So we went to physics department and with the help of uh, a group of John Tisch, we built a setup which can simultaneously do pump push and pump probe measurement on the devices exactly at the same condition, but with uh, 10 fem sub 10 femtosecond time resolution. So we hope that 10 femtosecond is something, it's, it's something faster than uh, even low, or low frequency intramolecular vibrations uh, happen on longer time scale. So this is really this is really fast, and we use this uh, this setup to see exciton formation in very well studied material, uh, polyfluorine, uh, uh, with with very high time resolution. Why we chose polyfluorine? Just because we wanted something blue absorbent. And this was, was the most blue the most studied blue absorbent polymer we, we had in mind. So this is a model study. It's not any fancy, uh, fancy new type of material. Uh, if we do not just normal transient absorption on, uh, on this device, we excite PFO, create excitons, and eventually charges. And we, by uh, probe light, we see where this excited state absorbed. In agreement with previous work, we saw that there are two peaks uh, of excited state absorption, one around 800 nanometers and around another around 600 nanometers. And from previous studies, also based on our analysis, this peak corresponds to charges, which will eventually be created if we excite PFO. And this uh, peak corresponds to excitons. So uh, we used uh, our pump pulse where PFO absorbed and our push and probe pulse we uh, overlapped with exciton peak. So we know that we either probe or push excitons only. From this, we can actually uh, plot the energy diagram of PFO material in our experiment. We pump somewhere to S1 or some state close to S1, uh, and then we can push this excitonic state up. And then eventually, this excitonic state uh, can dissociate into the charged state C1 we can't reach C2 in this experiment. Uh, so we did the experiments. We started with pump probe. We excited the sample, and then we probed when exciton, when excitons appear. And you can see that uh, very quickly we see a response, and then there, are, there is a little bit more of S1 generation, and then signal is kind of stable if we measure at very low excitation powers. This is not complete. This is not surprising at all. This is what we expected from pump probe. We excite system. We bring it from S zero to S one. Uh, population of S one is kind of uh, um, comes in immediately, and then excitons need a lot of time uh, to relax. Probably hundreds of picoseconds or nanoseconds. So on the three picosecond time scale, everything should be flat. So this is exactly what we expected and from this we can see our time resolution is about nine femtoseconds. When we do pump push measurements, now we don't see all excitons, we only see bound excitons. And quite surprisingly, we see very, very similar picture. We see that bound excitons are formed very quickly after we photo excite the sample. And then this bound excitons stay there for quite a long time. We can overlap two graphs and we see that if we pump at low power, uh, our two techniques, which measure should, should measure different states, should measure all excitons or only bound excitons, give very similar kinetics, which leads us to the conclusion that actually, at least in PFO, if we excite uh, close to the S1 state, we don't have something deal we see already bound state. It may be delocalized. The organization didn't happen yet, but the state already wants extra energy to dissociate. It's already bound state, which for me was uh, quite surprising. 
Uh, we tried to look a little bit in more detail into the system. I don't want to go into much detail, but for example, if we change the power, we can see that prop signal grows roughly grows roughly linear with the, with the power. We, we pump more, we get more excitons, but then we start seeing some decay process which we associate with exciton exciton annihilation. While pump push uh, measurements, we see some kind of saturation. We increase. Uh, we increase pump, but signal doesn't increase so much, and the decay is much less pronounced. Uh, we came up with a model which includes uh, excitation, a cooling of hot exciton, exciton exciton annihilation, and our push and charge generation. And with this model, very simple model, there are basically just three parameters uh, um, cooling rate, charge separation rate, uh, exciton exciton annihilation constant. With this uh, model, with three constants, we can ex explain all the data sets with different powers uh, which we have. And based on this global feed, we can extract the cooling time about 200 femtosecond, uh, spontaneous charge association time less than 100 femtosecond, sorry, uh, spontaneous charge association from uh, high line state SN about 100 femtosecond. And the most surprising for me is that actually, if we excite S1 state, we have S1 state, maybe the probably delocalized state. The organization didn't happen yet. No energy went to phonons yet, but this state is already bound. It doesn't want to separate uh, into carriers spontaneously. Well, this was an observation, experimental observation. Uh, the question always is, it, it works in practice. Does it also work in theory? And in short answer is yes. Sergei Tretiak just gave a very interesting talk. But here I bring in his uh, older work from 2012 with Jenny Clark and uh, Guillermo Lanzani, where they actually look on poly, uh, in, also on polyfluorine with a little bit lower time resolution. They looked on a different type of process. But Sergei's modeling had very high time resolution, and his modeling indeed shows uh, the time scale of uh, S1 population very similar to what we see. Um, in our experiments, so we are we are very pleased we can uh, confirm Ser uh, Sergey's calculations. And now, because Sergey's code is publicly available, um, uh, Mohammed from Jenny's group uh, is using it uh, to get a little bit more insight and ideally uh, go down to the evolution of binding energy and formation of bound state. Mm -hmm. This made me to the end of my talk. Um, Main conclusion is uh, that if we create electronic state in organic semiconductor, even if the state was just created, still delocalized, no reorganization happened, no energy was lost to vibrations, it might still be already a bound state, at least it is for PFO, and we are looking forward to look on more interesting systems. Uh, we see that exciton excess, excess energy dissociate uh, is, sorry, is, is, dis is dissipating on 100 femtosecond time scale, and before it, uh, it's dissipated, excitons can spontaneously dissociate. And yeah, we are looking forward to look on more interest uh, in material and less bound excitons. With this, I thank the funders and my group. This is pre COVID picture, and we are looking forward to make even better one after uh, we don't need to wear masks anymore. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Artyom, for the great talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, so I have my own question. When you analyze um, data at high um, intensity, light intensity, and you discuss exton exton annihilation, um, do you also need to consider interaction of exton with polarons, let's say, trions? Which uh, uh, it's, it's a good question. So we, we actually build many models, and we we build a model where we also have a C1 state. And so we have charge, exciton charge annihilation. But then we realize because this process basically takes some time to create C1 state on our times, on early time scales, there is no difference. So just for simplicity, we, we ruled out um, exciton charge association. If we, if we would measure at longer times, then we would definitely need it. But on this short time scale, it's not really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have a question? 
think Sergei had a question in the chat box. Oh, right, right, right. Sorry. Yeah, I just saw that. Um, uh, so Sergey asks, thank you a lot, Artyom. Great talk. I wonder if you see time-dependent relaxation dynamics depending where you push. Uh, yeah, this is what Jenny did. So I can I expect this question from Sergey. Uh, we didn't really, uh, um, I mean, uh, to have short pulses, we sacrificed the ability of pump pulse. Um, but because our pump pulse is broad, I think we, we see that there is a little bit of difference on the red side and on the blue side of the pump pulse depending on what we excite so in short in short answer we kind of see it yes we kind uh, of see the difference yeah there's one more question in the chat uh, from Atella. do you exploit the liquid crystal phase of t6 to self-ensemble ordered films um it's a Probably very good question to material person. For, may, maybe I'm wrong, but over, over here the uh, device fabrication is done by thermal evaporation. I'm not sure is liquid crystal phase formed and the thermal evaporation. So in short, I don't know. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can write me an email with a question, and I'll forward it to the right person. Um, any more questions to anybody? Any of the speakers, maybe? Um, so I guess if not, uh, thank you, Artyom, and everybody, all the speakers. Yeah.